Hi, and welcome back to CYC Ask. As we start a new season, we start with season two. And thank you for your patience while we were on break. And thank you for tuning back into season two. Season two is going to be great as we have something very special lined up for you guys. We've taken everything you have said on board. We have taken all the suggestions you have given us. And we're back with season two with all the suggestions and we hear to kick off season two with a great show tonight. I'd like to introduce you to tonight's topic, the power of the altar. Sometimes we see people during the mass, they grab a piece of paper and a pen and they write little notes and they send it to the deacon to put on the altar. Why do they do that? What's gonna happen when they place it on the altar? You're about to find out tonight. So please, if you have any questions, the phone number is 0416 292. I'd like to introduce you to tonight's guest. We have with us Father Paul Fanus. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you for having me. So, the power of the altar. Uh, I know it's a bit of a general topic, um, but I want to focus on some little things and about the altar and symbolism behind the altar. And but this, I want to focus a lot on this yeah, writing sure. on the piece of paper. So, I remember seeing this long time ago. Um, the older generation. That's something they would used to do, and they'll do it every single mass. And I'd see, being a young deacon, I'd always get this amul tant to come and tap me on the shoulder, and pass me a piece of paper and goes hatu fil hekale habibi put in the altar. So I've always been curious. So why do people do that? Um, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Ever since we were young, um, my mom every time would say anything. Oh, I'm gonna go pray on the altar. I'm gonna go put it on the altar. Everything I put it on the altar. I'm like, what do you mean put it on the altar? Like, what do you do? Just you jump on top of the altar? What do you do, mum? And then you see her writing in the mass and she chucks something on the altar. And, and not just my mum, the whole older generation, you see them all doing it. Unfortunately, we don't see the younger generation do it as much. Some people have discovered the secret, but a lot have not. A lot have not, unfortunately. And so it would be good if we learn uh, from our, our, um, our fathers and mothers this, this secret of putting things on the altar. You know, um, to put things on the altar, to, it's, it's symbolic. It's um, not just symbolic, it's, it's reality that we take my problem to God. You know, I have a problem. I don't know what to do about my problem. And the Bible teaches us when you have a problem, what do you do with the problem? The first step always is to take it to God, always. It's almost, it, it's a commandment. You know, there's a story in um, Second Kings of one of the worst kings in Israel, his name was Ahab. And he was a horrible, horrible king. And he committed a major sin. And uh, God said, you're going to be struck down, big punishment for his sin. And Ahab bows down in humility in front of God. And God says, okay, I will take away the punishment from you, but it will be on your son. And then you go a few chapters later and you find his son, a guy called Ahaziah. And Ahaziah, he falls through a roof and he injures himself. And his immediate response is to go and ask the Baals, what do I do? What can you fix me? And Elijah comes to him and Elijah says, because you went to the Baals before you came to God, then you're not going to get healed. So the, the Bible is teaching us that take your problem to God. Take your problem to God first. And then other solutions will come along. So the older generation has discovered this secret that I take my problem to God. And the other thing always to remember about this idea of taking the problem to God before I go anywhere else is really it it's, it's, uh, shows my humility that I'm not trying to fix my own problem. I'm not trying to, uh, with my own mental power or my own experience, to find the right person for the problem. I take it to God first, first step. It doesn't mean we don't try and fix our problems in other ways, but the first step is to take it to God. And if you take it to God, then you have the best chance of it being resolved. God hears our prayers. So I, I think the reason why people do it is that they just want to take the problem to God, throw it at God's feet, and then it's your problem, God. You know, and, and that's what God asks for us. Now that we know the, the secret, mm -hmm. does it actually work? A hundred percent. There's no question that taking your problem to God works. There's no question. Um, the people that have tried it know it. 
the people that have tried it know it and they're sure of it. Only those that have never really tried it are a bit skeptical, really. But why write it on the paper? Why not turn to God and ask Him? You know, it's, um, it, it's really a, a gesture. It's a gesture. You know, you learn from the Bible that between God has a very intimate relationship with, with His people. We are His people. He knows us by name. We know Him by name. And as a gesture, then we, we you know, there's the, like in the story of Zacharias, you see this, this Zacharias gesturing to God. Uh, um, I'm going to climb a tree for you. And then Christ looks up at him and says, I'm going to dine with you. And then Zacharias says, I'm going to give to the poor. And he says, all right, now I'm going to give you the kingdom. It's just a, um, giving, giving and taking gestures to one another. And so a gesture to God is to show him, here's my problem and I throw it at your feet. And, um, and then God's gesture back is to answer my prayer, is to read that little piece of paper and answer my prayer. That's his gesture back to me. And he does answer. There's no question that he answers. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, the answer is no, but that's because we might be asking the wrong things. Um, but what God does is He gives me joy in replacement of answering my request. So He can make me happy with the outcome, even though um, that's uh, not the outcome I wanted. Uh, so the answer, the prayer is always answered. Sometimes the answer is no. We have to accept that. You know, from our Father, fathers say no sometimes. Okay. Uh, Maybe something interesting to mm. come across. Oh, I've heard this before, but I don't know if people actually do this, but <laughs> finding a partner. Do, they, do people write <laughs> the partner's names or, or, for example, um, someone's going to buy a car or something, or, or something yeah. small, or tri it may be trivial in our eyes, but it could be <laughs> something special for them, and they just write it down and put it in the altar. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, uh, to be honest, the majority of prayers that come onto the altar when I'm praying is Arabic. Because uh, like I said, it's all the older generation. So I have no idea what's being written and if the prayer is being answered. But I, I believe the prayers are being answered because uh, they're in Arabic. But you do see, you know, some, you see lots of things. You see people asking, yeah, for partners. Or if they're in a relationship, just bless us. Just bless us. Or exams, that's a common one because that causes a lot of stress. Um, one really lovely habit I, I, one Sunday school servant at our church does is that every week... Um, they'll put the Sunday school lesson on the altar. The Sunday school lesson and the list of the kids wow. in the class. It's a really yeah. wonderful habit that God, um, you're serving them, not me. You mm. bless this, not me. Um, I'm just here as an aid. Uh, it's a really lovely habit that that person does. And I, I genuinely believe that they're blessed because of that. And I believe their service is blessed because they, they do that. Because God is definitely in charge of that lesson then. You know, he's in charge of those kids. Another servant, every week without fail, there's a list of all the servants um, that they serve with, all the kids that they serve. You know, it's really a lovely habit. Yeah. All right. I know in the Mass, when, when it comes to the section where the priest says, repose the souls, um, he always goes through a series of papers that are lined up in front of him. And I assume it's people's names who have departed. That's right, yeah. So people, yeah, and that's the other thing that people put on the altar. So people put requests. Uh, problems or they need something from God or just for blessings in general. Um, and then there's another set of papers which again uh, is asking for the, the reposed. So my grandmother or my, my mother or father or a family member or a friend who's passed on. And, and, um, and the church uh, in its wisdom and uh, in its um, understanding that we we serve a living God, not a dead God. And that when we, we, we get promoted into another life, not, we don't, the life doesn't end. Understanding that, the church offers up prayers and remembrance of these people. And the priest will put incense with each name. He doesn't have to put a spoon for each name, but if there's a lot of names, he'll just put a, a spoon in as each name is being read, as a remembrance. And in, in one way or another, we, I mean, we don't um, believe that we can change the outcome of someone once they've passed on. But one way or another, that prayer is heard for those who have passed. There is prayers in the church that pray for the departed, which, uh, which means that somehow or another it works. God is outside time, so uh, he, he can work in that person's life in, um, in uh, when, uh, it's not retrospect, but before time, because he's outside time. Yeah. So he, he sees that prayer before it's even happened. I know this is an older generation <coughs> thing, but do you also encourage the youth to do something? Yeah, like definitely. This? Yeah. The thing with the youth is that the youth don't, uh, besides their grandparents, they wouldn't uh, normally, uh, hopefully, know a lot of people who have reposed. Mm -hmm. So that's why they don't. But yes, it's a, it, it is it's it's definitely something that um, is is a part of the church is definitely heard before God, 
and it is a nice habit. Again, uh, my problem is that most of those um, come in Arabic, so I, I can't read them anyway. So I, I just assume that there's a few names there. Um, and then if I have, I'm lucky enough to have one of the other fathers with me, they'll come and read them and put the, the instance in instead. Yeah. Um, but certainly God, God reads Arabic, so he can, he can sort it out for me. Okay. Uh, when, I, when I was in Egypt last, we visited the monasteries in the villages, and I remember one of the monks was telling us that um, they get uh, the sawah who come and pray mm. in in the in when there's when no one's around in the in the altar, mm. and and they leave a mark on the altar, and when the monks of the monastery come to pray the mass and they see a mark, yeah. they don't use that altar; they move and use another yeah. altar. Why can't they pray a mass? twice on the same altar on the same day. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, and, and the mark that they normally leave is they leave the altar wet. Yeah. It's all wet. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they do, you know, at the end of the Mass when we raise the oblation and we put water and we do the, we do certain um, prayers, uh, they leave it all wet. So then yeah. the monk comes in, finds a wet altar, says, I can't pray here. Um, a big part of that is it's not just the altar that can't pray more than one Mass in a day. The, the priest cannot pray more than a Mass in a day. The congregation can't. The chalice cannot, the pattern cannot. Um, so so n really there should be one mass per day. And a big part of that, a big part of that is that when we, when we pray a mass, we enter into heaven. The whole idea, the way the church is designed, the way the church is built, the way the altar is built, the idea is we enter into heaven. And even they used to make the, the church in the shape of a ship, saying we're on a journey from earth to heaven on a ship. And so uh, when, you, when you journey from earth to heaven, you prepare for that journey. So that's why we fast. That's why we don't, you know, there's certain uh, things that we try and keep our purity in a certain way. We try and do things in a certain way so that we're fasted and prepared for the liturgy. And so uh, the priest has to be prepared. So that's why the priest cannot pray another liturgy. In the same way, the altar itself and the pattern and the chalice is all fasting for Christ's presence on the altar. Um, and so it's consecrated, and once, and also we, we, we release the angel of the oblation. Once we've released the angel of the oblation, it's once a day. It's not, uh, we just release it whenever we feel like there's, a, there's an oblation. Um, and normally, although some, serve, some churches with very big congregations don't need more than one, normally we don't need more than one. There's no need. So if, if people want to pray liturgy, there is one prayed. But there's ways around that for, for churches who need more than one service. Okay. That's very interesting. Mm. <laughs> um, so I know uh, when we go to church camps, they, all, they always bring out a portable altar. Mm. Um, but does this portable altar carry the same significance as the altar in the church? Yeah, uh, interesting question. Um, and that's one of the ways that we get around this problem of not more than one liturgy, is the idea of this portable altar. Um, so <clears throat> normally the, the priest, uh, when he prays a Mass, he's actually commissioned by the bishop to pray the Mass. He's not just choosing to pray a Mass now, we don't, of course, ask the bishop every single camp we're going to do, can we pray it? But it's, it's accepted that the, the, the bishop allows us to pray masses at camps. Um, and so as a symbol of that authority from the bishop, we have little um, planks of wood that have been prayed on by the bishop with the holy maroon, which is it's like a holy tablet. And that, that holy tablet is, um, allows, is consecrated. And that consecrates the table that we pray on. And it gives us the authority of the bishop that we are allowed to pray a mass in that setting. Also, the pattern and the chalice that we, we use is consecrated. So does it hold the same significance? Yes, yes. It's a liturgy. It's a consecrated table. It's um, a mass. It's an altar. It has all, holds all the same power as, uh, as a, a, um, a permanent fixture that we have in our churches. Exactly the same, the same authority. So it's just from the bishop directly. And it's been prayed on with the Holy May Room. Yeah, okay. Just a reminder to our audience members, if you have any questions to ask Father Paul tonight, this is your opportunity. Please don't be shy. Send us a text or give us a call and speak to Abuna tonight. The phone number is 0416-551-292. This is your opportunity. Please send in your questions. So I've always found this question very interesting, but I've never thought to ask anyone. But tonight is the time I'm going to ask. <laughs> the bishop, why is the bishop have has a designated burial under an altar? Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. When I saw the question, I, was, um, I wasn't 100% sure of the answer. Um, and I asked one of the other fathers, and, and, and they said that there's actually no rule. There's no rule to say that a bishop must be buried under an altar. They don't have to. 
Um, but you'll find that often, especially bishops of monasteries, they create their burial place well before they pass away. And a lot of people will look at this concept as very morbid. Why does a monk, and not just the bishop, all the monks, they, have, they build their, their, their coffin way in advance of their death and they have their place ready. And um, it's because monks always remember their death. Monks have this concept, this spiritual notion that they always remember their death. And so you'll find that bishops, uh, especially of monasteries, will set up their coffin way in advance. And then what they do is they often set it up as an altar, as an altar. Um, and as I said, it's not a rule, but it, it's a spiritual notion that I am under the foot of the altar. I'm, at, I'm in heaven. The altar is the presence of heaven, is the presence of God is, is heaven. You know, when the king is, is present, then I'm in heaven. And on the altar is the king is present. You know, my master is present. God is there. So if I... Uh, if I'm going to be buried anywhere, what better place than to be buried um, in, you know, in heaven on earth? And so they have the, uh, I, I, I long to meet my Creator. And if I can be buried anywhere, then let me be where my Creator was here on earth, which is on the altar, you know, in, in, in our churches. Uh, so it's a really nice spiritual notion. It's not a rule. They don't have to, but um, they would love to. And who wouldn't, you know? <laughs> We'd all love to be buried under an altar. That's actually really beautiful. Is it limited to bishops or can I do it too? <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably wouldn't allow it because <laughs> the whole congregation would do it. Yeah. We actually got a question that came in from an audience member. Mm. They're asking, um, what's the most preferred method, writing a prayer directed to God like a letter mm. or just your name for the priest to mention for you to pray to? It is up to you. It is up to you. Sometimes people won't write the, the actual situation because they're embarrassed. Or sometimes people will write the situation and not their name because they're embarrassed. And that's fine. God understands. God knows who the person is. Um, I think as long, uh, as long as you're writing, um, uh, it's up to you really. But as, you know, if you're comfortable, you write the, the situation so the priest has something to pray for. Uh, but it's not just the priest's prayer. It's really the priest is really irrelevant to the process. Um, it's it's God and you, and the priest is officiating. He's he's um, someone who stands guiding the ship into heaven. Um, but really, it's heaven that the doors open to answer the prayers. So it's really, it's up to you based on the situation. Um, but know that the priest uh, often, um, you know, he doesn't know, and he he just prays and he closes it again straight away. So there's no need to be embarrassed. But if you are uh, then just put your name or just a very brief uh, sketch of, of, of what you're thinking about and the priest will prep you and God understands. So uh, there's no preferred way, whatever makes you comfortable. Um, uh, but the idea of just making that gesture of writing my problem and, and putting it at the, at the foot of God, you know, at the foot of the cross, you know, which is, is the altar. Um, another question that come in... Um I know you've already answered this before when I asked it, but for the sake of the audience yeah, member, sure. they're asking, you mentioned take your problems to God through the altar. Why can't I take my problems to God directly through prayer? You can. So, so uh, putting a problem on the altar does not, um, uh, does not stop you from praying about it personally. You know? uh, personal prayer is really, really important. Um, and also, even when we ask for material things, it's a very important part of my relationship with God. Of course, as we climb the spiritual ladder, we start asking for more spiritual things. But asking even for material things. I learned that when I read a book from um, St. John of Kronstadt. He, he, he was a man of prayer. He did a lot of uh, services as well, but he was a man of prayer. And he, he made the point that it is natural for the lesser to beg for something from the greater. So It's natural for me to go to God and beg him for things, even material, even material. Um, he doesn't have to say yes. But it's all right for me to beg, just like a child begs their father for all sorts of things. He's our father. Uh, of course, as we start to get to know him a little bit more, then we come to him for his sake. So praying for, for things, you know, putting on altar doesn't stop you from praying. You should pray. It's very important that you do have that relationship with your father. So it doesn't replace it. It just adds to it. It's a gesture to God that, God, yes, I'm praying, but it's like, uh, if I'm praying, then do I fast my problem as well? Yeah, when you fast, it makes your prayer much stronger. When you put it on the altar, it makes your prayer much stronger. It gives you, it's a secret, it's a, it's a tool. God knows that humans that live on this earth, we need things. We need things that change. We need, sim we need gestures. We need physical realities to express heavenly realities. We 
We need something here to express what's happening in heaven. And a part of that is the altar. And a part of that is putting my request on the altar. You know, uh, Just like if I, I wanted something off a friend. You know, a, a friend might know I'm having a problem. But if I send them a text saying, please, please, please help me today with this. Or please, please, please pray for me. It's a gesture. They, like Even though they're already praying, they might give me some more extra time. It's something that is... And why shouldn't God be the same? Physical. He might not be physical, but we are. So let's use the physical things around us to help us get to God. One thing that gets me through problems is when I put it on the altar and the problem arises, in the back of my mind, I know the paper's sitting on the altar. So I say to myself, why are you worried for? It's mm. on the altor. Yeah, yeah. Psychologically, <laughs> so it helps. yeah. So yeah psychologically, it does. Yeah. And not just like spiritually, like, like it, it's at the foot of God. What more God can I throw my problem at you? I'm praying. I'm trying. You know, it, it reminds us of every part of the Christian life when I serve, when I'm fighting against sin. I'm doing everything I can, if I'm doing everything I can. Then my conscience is clear. God, what more can you want from me? And he doesn't want more from me. I'm just doing everything I can. I put on the altar, it's your problem now, God. You know, so make it his problem. And, and he accepts that. As our father, he accepts that. Yeah. We've got time for one more question before yeah. we go for a quick break. Uh, the action, it's from an audience member. They're asking, can women enter the altar if there's no mass being performed? Um, generally speaking, women shouldn't enter the altar, uh, you know, by, by, by church rules and rights. Most altars have a side segment that the women can enter. They can have communion there. Uh, often women will enter the altar, um, like, you know, they want to serve. So they want to, they want to clean. They want to, uh, so they'll normally clean, uh, parts of the altar, but generally speaking, the altar proper, um, the rule, the, the rules of the church say that, you know, women shouldn't enter the, the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. Uh, even, you know, the, and, uh, um, really only deacons and priests should enter the, the Holy of Holies. So even men who are not deacons are not Not, not theoretically. To, yeah. Of course, not a lot of people know the rule. So. Yeah, so it's not just women. No. So it's a, I think it's a bit of a misconception. Mm. So men and women who are not. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's uh, the priests and deacons, ordained um, people. I'm not, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we'll go for a quick break and we'll come back. We'll continue the discussion. We're, we're getting more questions from the audience, which Thanks is good. So, yeah. so, just a reminder to our audience members if you want to send in your question, the phone number is 0416 551 292. Please send us your questions and I, uh, we'll get an answer for you on tonight's live show. Thank you. CYC Christian Youth Channel. Hi, and welcome back to Ask on CYC. So coming back to the episode on the power of the altar, please, if you have any questions, we have with us Father Paul Fernus tonight. The phone number is 0416-551-292. Send us a text or give us a call and speak to the Father now. So we had another question that came in from an audience member. They're asking, is God more likely to answer my prayer if I write my request and put on the altar, for example, to help me during uh, year 12? Um, I think it's just it's something that we lose a blessing if we don't do. It, it's it's. I'm not saying God's not going to hear your prayer if you don't put it on the altar. So let's be clear. God hears our prayers. He he blesses us. Uh, some of us because we've never learned the lesson from our parents. Then then um, you know I never saw my parents do it. No one ever told me to do it. Therefore I never did it. And and but I'm saying for those of us who know, it's a secret. It's a secret. It's it's something that is powerful. Something that is important. And that if you do write it then it's extra blessing, blessing for you, you know. Um, it's like saying, um, if I don't, um, like I said, pray and fast, do I, does that mean God doesn't answer my prayer? No, He hears your prayer, but why not make it something much stronger in front of God? Uh, the altar it makes my prayer much uh, stronger. It, it's something that, it's a tool that we shouldn't miss the chance. You know, um, like I said, even, um, I'll tell you an example what happened in my life, this idea of, you know, devotion for spiritual things, it's something that's a bit lost on the younger generation. Uh, when when I was in Egypt, um, uh, Pope Shenouda he gives that weekly. This is when Pope Shenouda was alive. He gives that weekly um, Bible study slash sermon. So we were sitting close to the front, and as he was uh, just about to finish, he um, I saw a lot of movement. People were running in all directions, and I was wondering what's happening. Why is everyone getting up and running? I thought maybe someone was making an attack on the Pope or something. And then I discovered that he was just about to finish. And I didn't realize he was just about to finish because my Arabic is not very good. But everyone else realized that they ran in. And then the Pope got up and, and stormed off and disappeared. 
And all the people ran and they started taking blessings from the table. They started <laughs> grabbing it and kissing it. And, and as a confession, I'll make a confession. I was laughing. I was laughing. I wasn't, I wasn't taking it very seriously. And I started trying to video them. And I tried to even give it to my friend who happened to be a Buna Mark. I said, take a video of me while I, um, I go and take some blessing from the table. And he understood it better than I did. He refused to film me doing that because he said, you're making fun of them. And they're serious and they're going to get blessings and you're not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned the lesson. Yeah. And, you know, not to make fun because these people are getting blessings. So uh, does that mean God doesn't bless us because we don't do these things? No, we can still be blessed. But why not get extra blessing? And people do. People, you'll find miracles happen to them with this simplicity of heart, this simplicity of devotion. That I go to the saints. I go to the bishop, ask him to pray for me. I'm humble enough to throw my problem on the altar. It's not, I'm not going to fix it. God will fix it. And I throw it as, a, as like a physical gesture, you know, everything, you know, uh, St. Augustine says that um, the sacraments are a physical sign of an invisible reality. So there's an invisible reality happening. So why not make the most of it physically? Just a warning, Abuna, if this show goes viral, you're going to have stacks of papers sitting on your altar. <laughs> yeah, I know. I put them in your parish. <laughs> I actually got a question that came in from the audience. It's actually interesting. If they're asking, what's the life cycle of the paper? Does it get thrown out after it's been on the holy mm. altar? I wondered the same thing uh, when I first became a priest and I found all these papers on the altar. I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> I didn't know where they go. And, and then one day I grabbed them and I was about to go put them in the bin actually. I didn't know what to do. and I, I couldn't let them keep accumulating. Mm. And one of the elderly deacons at our church said, no, 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 Abuna, what are you doing? You know, throw them in the bin. I said, well, what do I do? He said, no, we keep a bag. And this is what we do at Amber Brahma. I'm guessing they do this in all the churches. They, they, get it, they have a bag. They put the prayers in the bag. And they put it underneath the altar. So they're always, the presence is always there in, in the altar. What happens when the underneath the altar gets full? I don't know. I've never <laughs> seen it. Um, but uh, it, it, your, your prayers go underneath the altar. They stay there. And, and it's like a, um, you know, this eternal prayer. Our prayers you know, in front of God, God is outside time. So mm. they're, they're always there. And God always answers our prayers. So they're there always. Well, that is much mm. more encouraging now. It is, isn't knowing it? Knowing that <laughs> it goes through another yeah, cycle. Bring in the candle and just burn it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, so let's talk about more at the, at the actual altar. Why is it designed that way? Um, so there's different um, parts of the altar, but <clears throat> there's a few things about the design uh, that make it, a lot of it's practical. A lot of it's practical. So some churches have the altar right up against the wall. Um, Whereas we have it so that you can circle around the altar, you can walk on all sides of the altar, because we use that for certain prayers. Um, the other thing is that the altar always faces the east. Uh, we know that, you know, this is something well known, that we always face the east when we pray, and we always face the east when we, we build the church. The idea is that we, we face, the uh, sim east is symbolic of the light, the sun rises, and so we're facing the light, not the darkness, which is the west. We also have the altar in front of the bosom of the Father, you know, uh, which <coughs> is symbolic of the idea that we are entering into heaven. And heaven is the presence of God. Heaven is its king. The kingdom is its king. So our king is there and we are all collectively as a church moving into the bosom of our father. So that's why it sits in that way. Um, it also has the appearance of a rock, you know. And we know that St. Paul said that Christ is the rock. And we find the same expression in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in I think Psalm 95, you find it also in, um, in the story of Moses that Christ is the rock. So it has this shape of a rock. Um, another interesting feature of the altar, in, in some churches in time past, the church, the altar was in the middle, the center of the church. And, and the church was built around the altar. No, so it wasn't always just facing east. Everyone was sitting around the altar in a circular fashion. I've seen one church in Egypt, I can't remember where, where they had it in the middle there. Um, and, and so the idea that the altar is the center, the center of the liturgical prayer. Uh, and so it has this uniform shape from all sides, so you can see from all sides. Um, and then on the altar, there's the throne, which holds the chalice, and uh, again, symbolic of the throne of God and, and things like that. Okay. Um, and I wanted to ask, but each church that I've visited always has three altars. Why mm. is there three altars? So again, it's not a rule. It's not a rule. Uh, some churches um, only have just the one somehow depending on the size and shape of the church um it's the main reason is two two, two fold reason one is practical 
as we said that some churches are very large, have a very large congregation, very large service needs. So they might need to have an early liturgy and a late liturgy or um, one over midnight and another one early morning. So to be able to pray a second mass, they have another altar. Some churches pray more than nine. Uh, 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 Father Paula was actually telling me that some churches in Egypt pray eight or nine masses a day mm. because the congregation is so large mm. and they come at different times of the day or different you know, people within the congregation, which is really interesting. And so the altar doesn't have three. I think the church has about uh, eight or nine altars. You know, wow. Really, really wide. Wow. You know, really interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so they, uh, they'll pray multiple. The other more spiritual reason why... Um, besides the practical, is that each altar is named after a saint. Each altar is named after a saint. We did, we, um, at Ambar Brahm Church, we laid the foundation stone on Sunday because we're building a new English church. And in the middle of that service, they said, what are you going to call it? What are you going to call it? Because that altar that we're going to build, even this foundation stone, gets a name of a patron saint as a blessing. So it's a blessing that we get to name a, a secondary altar after another saint. So... Amber Brown, we have Amber Brown, the main altar, and we have St. Moses, the black altar. We have St. Damiana's altar. So there's blessing from the, another patron saint, which is just extra blessing. So um, that's another reason why sometimes you have another altar to get a, a blessing from another saint. Okay. Let's say we want to take it the extra step and create something of symbolic as an altar at our home. Can yeah. we, are we able to do something like that? Look, I think, I think having uh, somewhere in your home dedicated to God is wonderful. And calling it an altar is wonderful. Having a space where we pray, we have icons, we have incense, we have candles. Um, more than anything else, it's a place that I go to pray. It's, it's a secret corner between myself and God. Uh, it's very important. Even in work or, or university life, I think it's important, say, on campus, to know a place that you can go to to pray. That's my altar at uh, university. That's my altar at work. Is this, this quiet spot that no one's going to find me just in the garden. If I've got a 10-minute break, I just go there and I sit and I pray. That's an altar. That's an altar because that's the presence of God. Um, at home, it's wonderful to have something like that. But do we uh, pray masses for ourselves at home, you know, and, and just invite a priest and have a, a, a mass at my house? You know, it, it's possible. A priest can come to people's houses and pray masses. It's rare and it's only very special need uh, basis because the mass or the liturgy is supposed to be a, a communal public thing it's not supposed to be something private that i just do whatever i feel like in my own home it's supposed to be communal supposed to be public everyone is invited it's not just for for this person sometimes if someone's very sick or elderly or special need or there's um because each home really is a church each home is a church um in the uh, for some reason the bishop has consecrated an area in a home they can do it but generally speaking, we go to church, we go to communal places where we pray. And to have a, a, a consecrated corner, consecrated in my, my eyes, that my house, that this is a room or a corner or a desk or, you know, some houses are small. Whatever you can, you can offer to God, offer it. Um, uh, I think it's very, um, I think it uplifts your home a lot. Kids particularly. Um, I, we had a place like that in my house growing up. And my mum always used to hassle me and my brother. Come, yalla, yalla and salli. Come, guys, we have to pray, we have to pray. And we would be like, oh, I'm in the middle of a movie, mum. We're not going to pray. And she would force us. And dad reluctantly would come along as well because, you know, he has to, you know, have solidarity with mum. And then we'd pray and we'd be like, oh, mum, hurry up, mum. Finish the prayer, finish the prayer. But I'll never forget those times when we prayed. And we had that little space that there was icons. And even though I was annoyed and I didn't want to be there, I'll never forget those prayers. I'll never forget my mum's influence in having a spot for God in her home that, for, that made her family come to. And so I think implementing something like that for, for our families is really nice. I think the kids, even in spite of them being annoyed, as long as we do it in a nice spirit and a nice way, not you know, very um, dogmatic, the kids even, they learn a lot and they love it. After time, they love it. Yeah. Okay. So th early this morning... Um uh, I, have a, uh, I got WhatsApp messages of um, different altars in Jerusalem from a priest who's in Jerusalem mm. at the moment. And he sent me the names of each altar. And I found it interesting. Like one is called the announcement of the birth of the Lord. One is called the altar of the Lord's first time in a temple. Another one's called the tomb of Lazarus, uh, St. Joseph's house, the wedding of Cain. I said, so I realized in the Holy Land, they built altars in very significant areas where Jesus visited. Mm. Why, why did they do that? 
Uh, you know, it's not just the Holy Land. They do the same in Egypt. Um, uh, again, Paul Apollo was telling me a story. I think it was Pope Theophilus once was about to um, consecrate a church on, on a spot. And then um, <clears throat> he had a vision that St. Mary came to him. And St. Mary said to him, what are you doing re-consecrating this spot? This spot is already consecrated. What are you talking about? He said, this is where, the St. Mary is saying this to him, this is where my son rested his head when he came to Egypt. And so it didn't get re-consecrated. It was already consecrated. So even in Egypt, there's churches like that. Um, <clears throat> and in Jerusalem, every spot that's significant that has a church built on it. You know, where they find the cross, they build the church, where they, uh, Annunciation, for example. Um, and I think the reason is these, these areas um, remind us of the impact God, Christ, had on this world. That Christ incarnated, He came, and everything He did was holy. And He did come in a point in history, physically. Yes, there is so much um, spirituality in it, but there's a physical reality to it as well. And as physical beings, we recognize that and we build churches on these, uh, these landmarks, these landmarks to remind us and also to recognize how holy these places are because Christ touched them. Now, Christ touches everything is in our hearts. He said that He's in our hearts. But at the same time, they, why not uh, recognize that certain spots where He was uh, are very significant? And they work spiritually as well as places of pilgrimage and places of remembrance and, and um, places where we can travel and, and pray a bit more, or, you know. And a lot of people now are going to Jerusalem and they, they're really experiencing the spirituality of this walking the steps of Christ and seeing, oh, this is where St. Mary was when that happened and this is where Christ walked and, oh, that's when he fell over. And, you know, it really adds a lot to my experience because, you know, our, our understanding of Christ comes from his story, from in the Gospels. You know, his story gives us our understanding. So why not get a bit more taste if we have the, the luxury of being able to go to Jerusalem? Yeah, okay. We got another question that just came in from the audience asking, "What's the difference between putting the prayer in the hamal, uh, the oblation bread, or on the altar itself?" That's a good question. You know, I, until again, again, until priesthood, I didn't know people put it in the hamal. I, I, and then I opened, um, you know, the first few times I prayed mass, I opened the hamal, and I find a piece of paper there. And at first, I thought it was it was I just I accidentally. I didn't yeah. realize it was a prayer. And then I, I saw the other fathers take them and 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 pray on them and there's a certain part right at the beginning of the liturgy where we, when we baptize the lamb we then put the lamb the baptized lamb on the prayers physically uh, as as um to say that you know the lamb is going to answer these prayers please hear these prayers and um <clears throat> and so i think there's no difference between the two i think i'm not sure who puts them in the ha the hamel but i guess that's the people who make the orban so they're there early enough and they they they, they pop it in and they understand that that the choosing of the lamb and the baptism is a very special time in the liturgy, so it's there at the beginning. It doesn't come later. But I, I don't know. From my perspective, there's not much of a difference. It's just um, practicality and also just you know developing an understanding of of the liturgy a little bit. You know, when you start to understand the liturgy a bit more, when you understand Christ is on the altar, you start to develop your own uh, interactions with the altar. Okay. We have time for one more question, and what's a better way to end the show with you telling us a miracle on the power of the altar? Well, um, just before we started, you told me a miracle or that happened on the altar. I'd love <laughs> to hear that miracle first. <laughs> if I give you one, you give me one. <laughs> um, so what inspired me to do this show was um, I had a, a, a youth who came to the, one of the youth meetings, and he was never a regular, and um, he realized that I've, I've always, I was always there, and I was always greeting him. So he came to me and said, um, please keep me in your prayers. I have a problem. And I said to him, because I've always, um, you know, I've always known about this piece of paper yeah. and the power of the altar, but I've never was a true believer. And so I said to him, you know what, instead of praying for you, come with me. I took him inside, um, got him a piece of paper, got him a pen. I go, write your problem and we'll put it on the altar. So he, he listened, he, um, he wrote it down, he, 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 his faith wasn't that strong, but he, he kind of had some inclination that it could work. A month later, I see him, he came to church happy and hugging me, and, <laughs> uh, and he said to me, now I believe in the power of the altar. Um, and then he just became regular mm. at the youth meeting, and, he, and he, he strongly believes in the power of the altar now, and now my faith in the power of the altar has become way stronger, stronger because of that, through yeah. his experience. Mm. Yeah. And the real power really is the change of heart of a person. Mm. So 
um, you know, all these things that, that change in our lives that make us believe in God, really the real miracle is that I believe in God, that I have a relationship with God. And so that's how you know the real power of the altar, that someone is drawn that in that way. Um, you know, one story I, I heard about the altar was, um, I think it was Bishop Macarius in Egypt, Upper Egypt. He, um, one day he was with, praying a Mass in the altar and the deacons were a bit tired, I think, and so they were resting lazily on the altar. And he kept looking at them and he was getting agitated by this, no, stand up properly. And they, they didn't. So he, um, he hit the altar with his hand like that. And the deacons said that they felt an electric shock go through <laughs> their bodies. It was an electric shock and of course they stood up straight away and they didn't touch the altar again. And, and I think Bishop Macarius and God was teaching them a lesson, uh, approach with dignity, approach with respect, uh, understand what's in front of you. It's something that's very powerful, that's very um, sacred. Um, don't treat it lightly. You know, and approach with humility as your friend did. You know, to be told to do something like that and not really believe in it, but to do it anyway is a symbol of your humility. It shows um, that I'm willing to, to make myself low and try. Why not? And so that making yourself low it moves the heart of God. So that humility of throwing my problem at God and not trying to resolve it myself is something that really makes our prayers answered. And of course, there's many, many miracles uh, that happen from the altar, many you ask any priest in Sydney, they'll have many, many personal stories about these things. Again, uh, one parish priest was telling me one time he invited someone to come into the altar to have communion. And the person hated someone close to him. And so he said, uh, please come in and have communion. And the man physically could not get past the sanctuary doors. Physically. And this is a parish priest uh, in Sydney at the moment. This is not a story from the Senexarium. Wow. He couldn't get in physically. And, um, and, and the father said that the lesson was, you have to reconcile, you know. Don't leave your offering at the altar and go and reconcile. Don't come back here until you've reconciled. You know, the, 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 the altar is unity. When we put prayers on there, it's, it shows the unity between me and the priest and the people. We pray for one another, not we hate one another. For us, the prayer can't be answered. And so that person had to go and, and whether he did or not is, who knows. But the lesson is, is clear that... Um, that the, the, the altar is powerful. There's, there's, there's a, it's a physical sign of an invisible reality. That invisible reality is there. Understand it's there. Okay. I'd like to thank you very much for tonight's show. Yeah. It was uh, very insightful and very interesting. Uh, different, you gave us a different take on, on the altar, and I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And thank you to our audience members who tuned in tonight's show and for sending in the questions. Please tune in same time next week as we kick off Season 2. I'm Ina Ibrahim from your CYC Studios in Sydney. Good night and God bless. Christian Youth Channel.